I, I've not been in a situation that would parallel um, the level of instability and security and, and catastrophic destruction as Gaza. The one difference with Gaza is that there's nowhere that is safe. There is nowhere you can go um, where there is no risk. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan selamat datang ke episod ke-96 Keluar Sekejap bersama dengan saya KJ Dan saya Syaril Hamdan Syaril, uh, saya nampak berada di perantauan ke? Saya di perantauan, saya di Singapura KJ Singapura, adakah Syaril sudah menjadi penasihat kepada bakal Perdana Menteri Singapura Sebab ada pengumuman baru ni bahawa Lawrence Wong akan menjadi The New Prime Minister of Singapore? Uh, belum lagi, belum lagi uh, Hanya untuk tugasan-tugasan kerja yang biasa Uh, tapi banyaklah perbualan dengan rakan-rakan di Singapura berkenaan dengan transisi kepimpinan negara Singapura yang tak lama lagi. Okey, mungkin kita boleh bincang dalam episod yang akan datang berkenaan dengan isu tersebut. For this episode to the listeners of the KS podcast, we have a extremely special episode and again the disclaimer at the beginning of this episode that this uh, particular episode will be conducted fully in English because uh, Cheryl and I have very, very special guests in the studio today. And this episode will cover something I think where a lot of Malaysians have been following, uh, perhaps the most pertinent international issue of our generation, if not our lifetime. Um, on the 8th of October, Israel declared war on Hamas. And since then, Israeli forces have launched massive attacks in Gaza and in the Gaza Strip. And this has involved heavy bombardment and raids, not just on residential areas, but on schools and crucially on hospitals, health centers, places of worship, ambulances, refugee camps. The day after that, Israel announced a total blockade on Gaza. And this included a blockade of a ban on water and food, and this severely restricted the import of essential supplies into the Gaza Strip. We know that since then, uh, the Israeli forces have moved south and they have ordered people to flee and for hospitals to be evacuated. The numbers up to today are absolutely staggering. We know that From reports from the Gaza Health Ministry, more than 33,000 fatalities, Palestinian fatalities, and of this, roughly 40% are children. We know that 75% of Palestinians, about 1.7 million Palestinians, are now internally displaced. That means they've been forced to leave their homes, their villages, and are now basically wandering, or if not, in refugee camps. We also know that... 1.1 million people are projected to face catastrophic levels of food insecurity. That's the IPC phase five, which is really the worst catastrophic famine level that is recorded. The situation in Gaza is not improving. For almost six months, people there have been denied access to food, water, shelter, and most critically, to healthcare. If you've been following the KS podcast, you know that we've been covering this closely almost on a weekly basis. But for this episode, we are privileged and honored because we have guests who can shed light on what is happening on the ground and also shed light on a key non-governmental organization that has been in existence since the early 1970s that has brought medical relief humanitarian assistance to conflict areas around the world. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce our guests for this episode of Kluas Kejap. Uh, first, welcome Dr. Yuko Nakajima. Dr. Yuko Nakajima is uh, chairman of Médecins Sans Frontières in Japan. Have I got it right? The chairman of MSF, Doctors Without Border borders in Japan. She is an emergency physician and most crucially, she has been to Gaza 
and she has seen the reality on the ground. And we look forward to Yuko, Dr. Nakajima, sharing with us the reality on the ground in Gaza as somebody who's seen personally up close the devastation that has uh, occurred in the Gaza Strip and what the humanitarian crisis that the people of Gaza are confronted with. Together with Yuko is Paul McFun, who is the director for Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia, also for Médecins Sans Frontières. Now, Paul's been uh, with uh, MSF since the 1990s, 1997, if I'm not mistaken. He's been to many conflict areas, not yet been sent to uh, Gaza, but uh, he will also support uh, Yuko in the discussion as far as MSF's role is concerned. What we can do in this region to help MSF, and MSF is an independent NGO. I think most of their funding comes from uh, individual private donation. And it's essential that we continue to support organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, in providing humanitarian relief in some of the worst conflict uh, affected regions around the world. Yuko, let me start with you because for many of us, we only see videos, photos, we know the numbers. Many people are familiar with the numbers that I've rattled off just now. But that can never really replace the reality on the ground. For someone who's been there and seen the devastation that has taken place in Gaza, can you perhaps put into context and tell the listeners of KS, of Kluas Kajab, what the reality is like on the ground in Gaza today. So I've been with MSF since 2010. I've completed eight um, uh, missions, uh, field de uh, deployments, and many of them were in conflict zones. Um, however, this one was the most devastating, a whole different level of of just tragedies it's it's it was um something that i've never seen the uh level of the the injuries um the volume and just the whole infrastructure system being destroyed and it was actually the first time ever that I was um, just mentally and psychologically affected by the work we are doing. Um, and I was actually part of a 13 um, team member, uh, first emergency response team who went into Gaza. Um, it was meant to be a team that could independently conduct medical activities. When, when so, was that, Yuko? Sorry, it was... Um, we, we were called on October 14th. It took about two weeks to actually get mobilized to gather in Cairo. Um, and we actually had some, uh, I guess, challenges getting into Gaza. It took about two weeks after that too. It was packing and, and trying to leave, but then being sent back. Um, there was a lot of uh, difficulties getting in. Finally, we got in, um, that was November 14th. But we were the first um, after the conflict had started. Um, and so there was a lot of unknowns. Um, we didn't know how, where to stay, where to work how much um, supplies there are, electricity, fuel, food, lots of unknowns, but we did the best we can to prepare to go into Gaza. We really, so the 13 member team, um, we consisted of uh, surgeons, so orthopedics, um, actually one, one each, uh, an orthopedist, a uh, general surgeon, um, anesthetist, nurse, nurse anesthesiologist, uh, pharmacist, um, uh, uh, coordinators, actually three coordinators, um, and so on. And 
you know, so we, we were a team of um, very experienced um, MSFers. When you went in, were you undertaking medical procedures that were routine or medical procedures which were related to the conflict? Related to the conflict. And, conflict. and what, just walk us through the, some of the things that you were doing. Yes. So, so we went in. And so the big thing about MSF is we're very agile and flexible and we do whatever we can to, to meet the needs of what is going on. And there were catastrophic war trauma, war wounds that usually we would never see in our home countries. Um, but being trained in what we do, we did our best to uh, deal with these severe, severe traumas such as um, amputations, um, severe defects of tissues, uh, deep, deep, deep burns, very extensive all over the body, um, uh, horrible, horrible fractures, you know, comminuted, um, just, just very unstable fractures, open fractures, just so many horrible traumas we saw. Also, we saw these subacute phases, patients who the trauma wounds who were fixed uh, being infected and horribly infected. And that comes from lack of infrastructure, lack of medications, um, a clean environment. And, and we saw those infe infections that were taking the lives of people. So there's the trauma and then there's the medical patients who both on both ends are very severe. And also there's the non-trauma people who lost their access to, to medicine, right. chronic diseases. Right. So like we see in our home countries, diabetes, um, hypertension, arrhythmias, they lost their medications, they don't have a home to stay. So we saw a lot of um, elderly people who got, um, they're living outside now in tents, so getting pneumonias. Um, people are having horrible arrhythmias, very fast heart rates. Um, you know, missing dialysis, so their uh, their potassium is super high, and 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 just so many, so many medical issues in all sorts of different aspects and phases. And did you feel your thirteen member team? I suppose you went to a few hospitals, or were you just stationed in one hospital? Um, basically, I would say one hospital, okay. Nasser Hospital, Nasser which hospital. is which is now not functional. Yeah. Um, at that time, it was the biggest functioning hospital. At that time, uh, the North was right. being attacked. attacked yes. So there were many people from the North Moving evacuating. South. Exactly. And, and kind of um, uh, evacuating um, in Nasser Hospital. So there were citizens, there were doctors, nurses who actually were living in the hospital. Too. So at that time, did you fear for your own safety where you were at that point in time? So probably I would say no. Um, it, it was like a different level dangerous um, context, which uh, for the first time ever, actually when our team went into Gaza, this was in Cairo when we were preparing, we signed this... Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, this this waiver, maybe, waiver saying that we understand that this is right. very, very dangerous. And it was the first time for us. Um, anyway, so so it was very dangerous. We all knew it, but all, we, we were ready for it. We knew what we were going into, but we still wanted to go. And I guess so by that time when we were in Gaza, I mean, all we cared was, was the patients in front of us. So... You know, we kind of knew that, but it wasn't really worrying for me. And I think I think my team also are a little bit of maybe crazy people <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who are a little bit different yeah. um, than, than normal. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to ask another crazy guy to just uh, step into the conversation <laughs> right now. Paul, you've been to conflict uh, areas in the past. Now you could describe the 13 members that came in through Egypt and went into Gaza and served at the Al Nasser Hospital. But I've been told that you also have around 300 um, MSF staff and volunteers 
in Gaza, Gazan people. How do these guys deal with it? Because they are doing your work, MSF work, bringing aid, bringing humanitarian assistance, and yet their own homes are presumably being bombarded, destroyed. How do you manage that in terms of their morale, their their assistance to them, what's happening with them? I mean, the first thing I would say is, is yeah, I've worked in a lot of conflicts, but I, I've not been in a situation that would parallel um, the level of instability and security and, and catastrophic destruction as Gaza. The one difference with Gaza is there is nowhere that is safe. There is nowhere you can go um, where there is no risk. So in most conflict settings, we we can adapt our model. You no, know, we can p- position ourselves so that we have some control over our mobility. We have some possibility to get people in, get them out, particularly evacuate patients, refer patients, and pull our teams out, have periods of pause. Um, so, so we have those tactical options to to, to position ourselves in a in, in a way that doesn't expose our patients or ourselves to unacceptable levels of risk. But in Gaza, and Gaza particularly today, that 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 is simply not an option. And for our Gazan team members, I mean, they have suffered and gone through you know, unparalleled, unbelievable reality in the last six months. Many, many of them have lost family members, multiple family members. They themselves have lost their homes. They've been displaced. And yet still, they continue to assume this medical responsibility to return to facilities. So our, our operations, we, we, we do our best to try um, and have some oversight and control um, of, our, of our medical responses. But in the context of Gaza, we have MSF staff who, who of their own choice, are choosing to remain mm. in, in some of the um, most dangerous mm. parts of Gaza and work alongside you know, Ministry of Health colleagues. We're still in contact with them. And they're trying to do what they can with the very limited access to supply, uh, safety, security, sure. uh, et cetera. And then we have locations where we've built more of a, a center of gravity, if you like, which at the moment is, is Rafa. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, our ability to move around is extremely limited. And that's where a lot right of people now. are crowded around right now. And that's where they? a lot of people are crowded. And so you yeah. have to understand that our own staff uh, are no different to anyone else in Gaza. They've yeah. been through everything else. Yeah. And, and yet they still try to do what they can. And, and most strikingly, they take a responsibility for our international team members. Yeah, yeah. And we, we cannot operate there um, and bring the kind of expertise that, 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 that Yukosan brings um, into Gaza without... Without these guys on the ground. These guys on the ground. Yeah. They, they know how to make things work locally. Yep. They maintain the contacts that we need to have you know, with all sides of the conflict. It's so volatile, it's changing hour by hour. Yep. Um, so without, without this kind of team around us, um, you know, we, we couldn't bring in the expertise, the supply, um, uh, and the experience that we have to work alongside our national colleagues and, as Yuko said, try in agile ways to yep. respond yep. even in these kind of extreme circumstances. Yuko, I want to go back to you. and I'm mindful that Sharil's having some technical problems to connect with us, so he'll jump in when he can. Before October 2023, there was already a 16-year blockade of Gaza. So this is a strip of land which many people have described as the biggest open-air prison in the world or refugee camp in the world because of the Israeli blockade. You're from Japan. You've served in hospitals in Japan. You've you've been and trained in hospitals in in the United States, and we know that uh, the Gazans and the Palestinians have extremely competent physicians. But can you explain to us the the level of medical infrastructure and facility that was already in Gaza pre- prior to the bombardment? I mean, were they already facing challenges? This is just to give context to viewers about the what Gaza's like. Um, so I actually, it was my first time in Gaza and this was after October 7th. So I don't know, I have not seen, um, what it was like. However, I see the, the level, I mean, of the physicians are extremely, extremely competent and, you know, they, they have that same knowledge as, 
you know, what, what you would expect in a, a doctor in Japan, um, but also this, uh, this knowledge and experience of war trauma, war yeah. wounds and in resource limited uh, settings. So I feel like there were a lot more competent and, and knowledgeable in terms of w the, the kinds of cases you see um, in Gaza. Uh, the, the facilities. So I would say it's, it was pretty good for, for me. You know, they, I think they had enough, um, you know, for example, like the, the OR, uh, the, the, uh, anesthesia machines that they have and, and all that were good. Although there probably should be more is, is my, um, right. my impression. Um, so doable, but limited, not ideal. Right. Um, is in terms of supplies. Okay. Cheryl, I, I noticed you're back on. Maybe you want to jump in before anything else happens to you? Ah, he's still stuck. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Um, yeah, so one of the big casualties of, of this conflict or genocide, as we like to call it here, is truth. And... Part of this is trying to ascertain the scale of the what's happening there. Uh, the figure that I mentioned earlier is a figure that's always been used by the Gaza Ministry of Health, 33,000 or so. Some media outlets have always reported this with a caveat, saying that it's very difficult to ascertain the true figure. And I'm sure... In war, it is quite difficult to ascertain this figure. And this is a question to both of you, I guess. Uh, you go first, probably. From what you saw and from what you heard, I'm not going to ask you whether that figure is accurate, but is it within that ballpark? Is, that, is the scale of uh, life loss of that, of that um, degree? Mm -hmm. Yes, to me, it's... I mean, I don't know the exact numbers and it's hard to tell, but we did receive many waves of mass casualties, which I've seen many um, already dead. Um, so these were children dead on arrival? Many were children and women. My first mass casualty that I encountered after it was shocking, after I got back, I... I thought about it and then I realized that there were only children and women for my first mass casualty. And um, there were a couple um, at least during, you know, a day. And we actually weren't, we wanted to, but we weren't able to live and stay in the hospital because so everybody lived in the hospital. There was not enough space. So we actually commuted from, from a clinic that uh, MSF used to have um, where we stayed. And we know that at night there was a lot more airstrikes and mass casualties that came in because it was at night that we heard so many airstrikes. And also when we show up in the morning, the staff would say, um, you know, we, we look exhausted saying that there were mass casualties all night long. Um, so from what I've seen, there were many, many deaths, many, many war, um, trauma, even if you survive for, you know, so our job is to resuscitate patients. Even if you survive for a couple uh, days, weeks, you know, th there's no long-term care existing. So, we see subacute death. Mm. Um, so, uh, to me, it feels accurate. Although I don't know the exact numbers. Well, I've seen you on on some interviews, and and you've addressed this issue of the numbers. Um, any thoughts? I mean, we can't even account for all of our staff. Yeah, you know, and we we, we know over two hundred aid, aid workers have been killed. We know of five of our own staff that have lost their lives, um, um, but we have staff we we simply can't account for. I mean, there there is no way to maintain, um, you know, accurate statistics on what's really taking place. I think we're we're clearly working with estimates, and those are underestimates. Yeah. In terms of loss of life. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah, when it when it comes to other major risks like the question of um, of famine and malnutrition, in any other setting, we we would survey that so that we had the the kind of evidence we needed to understand who's been affected, where, at what scale, to launch a response. I mean, here you, you can't you, do that. You can't do any of this. Yeah. So you really are working quite blind. Sure. It's, it's much more a reactive response sure. to what happens day by day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, than anything else. Sharil? I'm just going to jump in some some connection problems. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult even with the best effort to try and paint the picture uh, and have people who've not been there understand. But I think you're both trying to do the best you can. My, my, my question is maybe tell us a bit more about the people on the ground. It's not just MSF. It's also some of the UN agencies, a number of other NGOs. Uh, paint a picture for us what these uh, who are these kind of people who, who who are willing to risk their lives and uh what is the dynamic between the different organizations and the powers that be on the ground uh when it comes to delivering aid you go yes um so when i was there um icrc a team of icrc um was working at european gaza hospital um ICRC actually was able to get in a, a little earlier than us. Um, and I think it's because they had, um, you know, they were involved in the hostage exchange and stuff like that. But um, anyway, they were working really hard. I've never met them because our movement was restricted. Um, but who I tells you guys where to go? Like ICRC goes here, MSF goes there. Is there any coordination there or? The, the Gazan Health Ministry does that? I think for MSF, um, MSF, we, we've been working at Nasser Hospital in okay. one complex, just right. the, the the OR. So I think it was natural to, to decide, you know, and minding we were the first team to go in. And that was the first thought of, okay, Nasser Hospital seems to still be working. We're going to go back to where we were used to, we used to work. Um, and then, so we joined, uh, the, the, uh, the locally hired staff, um, uh, the Palestinian staff who were working there, who continued to work there, um, since October 7th. Um, so, so it was natural for us. Um, I don't know of any, coordination in terms of sure. you go there, sure. you go there. Um, but we did, I know the coordinators. So this was, you know, the coordinators on our team were constantly in contact with the others um, in the area, especially um, ICRC. Um, I know there were people from uh, the UN also, um, not like constantly working, but I guess like surveilling a little bit. Um, and uh, there is an effort to coordinate with the other organizations um, in the area. Yeah. I, I, mean, yep. I mean, in all, all emergencies, co coordination is the responsibility of the UN, um, usually UN OCHA. In the case of Gaza, it's mm -hmm. UNRWA. So they, they, they take a role to establish this kind of knowledge and architecture um, and, and, and lead on, on bringing together essential information that you need to know about where are the gaps, who's doing what, where, what capacities exist, et cetera. The problem here in Gaza was it's so limited, it's so restrictive anyway to get in. Uh, very few organizations with the background experience capacity to necessarily work in that kind of hyper insecure environment. Um, that, the, that the environment doesn't actually uh, enable a great deal in, t in terms of, of you go here, you go there. And on top of that, it's so volatile. I mean, it's changing literally hour by hour, day by day, um, in, in terms of where you can work. So, so for us, a natural orientation well, is, is, of course, to work in the facilities where we're known. We can identify ourselves. Um, it's clear who we are and what we're doing. Um, but outside of that, to have a more regional, sure. regional coordinated approach, the context simply does not allow it at the moment. Yep. Um, so it's much more by default, you know, where, where, where with you know, wh where can you assume an acceptable level of risk to be able to undertake the kinds of activities that you feel can have the biggest impact? And that is, of course, coordinated and exchanged between those lead agencies that are on the ground. Um, but it, th this is not um, comparable to any other kind of emergency scenario situation where you'd see mm. a large-scale response, a lot of organizations in need for yeah. you know, significant coordination, mobilization, et cetera. 
you could you were based uh, okay, if i can if i can just quickly jump in uh kj uh i think i've heard paul mention twice now this is a situation beyond compare in in the work that you do and the other agencies uh, do the fact that uh, you are being you know at risk in a way that has never been the case elsewhere you've had hundreds of medical personnel and aid workers uh, health workers killed uh, you have bombings of hospital of ambulances how much of all these coordination and decisions that you make on a day to day basis you make on the fly uh, and not based on any sort of playbook uh, that exists prior to what ha- what's happening now i i would say we rely primarily in this kind of extreme volatile situation on the leadership we have on the ground and it it can't really be any other way so you you establish uh, certain rules of engagement no the, the, these are the principles in this kind of hyper insecure environment in which we're going to operate very limited movement we have to have these checks and balances in place we have to have undertook these communications with all known actors um etc cetera, etc cetera. but but then you're not in control of that situation it is so volatile you can't go through several levels of agreement and coordination mm-hmm. and approval when you know risk can change from one moment to the next and this is where as yuko said you know we, we would never send an experienced people into this kind of context this is where you need you need people who really have that level of experience um and and also i i guess the an extremely high level of emotional maturity to be able to manage the pressures that they're going to be under in those in those kinds of circumstances um and 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 yeah we we they have to agree to assume those responsibilities and the associated risk and we have to trust them yep. with a high level of decision making you call um a lot of the care in in healthcare will be dispensed at the primary healthcare level you were at the hospital um you alluded to the fact that a lot of follow up treatment was compromised because of the unavailability of of primary healthcare clinics i presume were also attacked and and destroyed can you also just describe that that scenario maybe we we focused a bit on the hospitals but maybe the, your experience about how primary healthcare also essentially shut down and a lot of the cases were referred to hospitals and that resulted of course um when it decans to the hospital it becomes a bit overwhelming mm-hmm. um yes so primary healthcare became pretty non-existent i do know that um the palestinian msf staff that we worked with um i didn't go too much i visited once there was a primary healthcare um clinic that they they ran you know we kind of compromised did a makeshift um i guess system where we pulled the doctors to in a room and then it was open to the public who who had so we saw a lot of they were seeing a lot of uh infection meaning um the the URIs you know the the diarrhea sure. upper respiratory infections and 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 um you know lots of children um being affected um with that and then at that time uh, malnutrition we were concerned of and so we started to do this like checking of you know like the circumference of the the arms and stuff like that at that time um it was maybe one out of i think we saw i was doing the tallying um i did i think i saw like one out of maybe 80 children who was less than average uh, circumference but anyway um that is something that msf uh realized that primary care is something that we also need to uh address and and um like be, be involved in and that was something that it was not my direct involvement but another team was was working on because i, I suppose the the effect of this what's happening in gaza today will reverberate for many many years to come you're not just talking about a trauma wound you're also talking about like you said kids missing out on development milestones because of what's happening in that region so just before we take a break moving perhaps and it's so difficult to speak about this now because there, there doesn't seem to be an end in sight does msf 
uh, will MSF follow? I mean, you've been in Gaza for many, many years, even predating the the offensive and the genocide. Will that be something that MSF will be looking at in reconstruction later? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have a, a huge commitment to um, Palestinian territories. And and as you touched on earlier, no, I mean, 16 years of blockade ha- had crippled that population. I mean, they were living at subsistence level in many respects. Um, health infrastructure, uh, although at, at a certain level, is massively impaired. And our ability to operate prior to this, you know, this current conflict, um, you know, was 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 hugely restrained and controlled. I mean, it was very, very difficult for us to medically evacuate someone from Gaza before this conflict. And in the months preceding this, I mean, we, we've responded to periods of, um, of conflict and violence over the years in Gaza. In 2022, we conducted 1,200 surgical interventions in Gaza. So the, the cost on that population is, has been going on, yeah. has, has been going on for years. And there is a that there always was a collective, you know, mental and physical trauma in in that society in that population. What's taken place now? Uh, we keep calling it unprecedented. Yeah. Um, but the recovery for the for for this for this um, for our Gazans for this for this population is 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 going to be incredibly an incredibly long journey. I mean, infrastructure and the level of destruction. It's mind-boggling to imagine, you know, how long it would take to to create, you know, adequate living conditions for people. Where, um, yeah, at the moment there's only 12 hospitals that are partially functioning, um, that remain um, to service a population of, uh, you know, over two million people. I want to, yeah, I want to add. Um, so my prior uh, field experience, I was uh, working in Iraq. Uh, this was 2022. And they were in the um, middle of rebuilding after um, the battle uh, that took place 2014, 15, I think. And it was seven years after the conflict, still rebuilding, still, you know, needed help in terms of the medical infrastructure. So that that's why MSF was there and I worked there. And comparing to that, so much worse in the it's it's a in whole Gaza. different level yes in Gaza which made me even in Iraq I was thinking um wow seven years and still they are rebuilding this these things take so long to go back to normal and then thinking of Gaza I can't even imagine how long it will take to to get back to I mean, I don't think it was even normal even before all this happened, but it's just unimaginable. We're going to take a break, a quick break, and we'll come back with uh, with Yuko and Paul from MSF to discuss further the reality on the ground in Gaza. Welcome back to this special edition of uh, KS, uh, episode 96, where we are joined by two representatives from Edison Sans Frontier, Dr. Yuko Nakajima, president of MSF Japan Board of Directors, as well as Paul McFun, who is the director for MSF for the Asia Pacific, as well as Southeast Asia. We've been talking about the reality on the ground in Gaza. And Cheryl seems to be drifting in and out of KS consciousness before he drifts out again. I'm going to let him have the next question. Yeah, uh, thanks. I just wanted to ask... um, Maybe as dire as the situation is today, what are your concerns moving forward? Can it get much worse? I think the answer is yes. And I wanted to get a picture from you. How can it get worse? Is it? Are you worried about medical supplies being more inadequate than it already is? Uh, that the death toll actually increases? Is, is, is that how you picture this going forward in the coming weeks? Either one, yeah. Good. So... So, I mean, what, what we're seeing now after six months is a kind of compounding effect of besieging an entire population to, to the point where, where people are starving. Um, the, the unprecedented scale of trauma, and as Yuko-san has, has explained, 
it's not just the injury and the way that's treated, it's the complications and the post-complications, the infections, the spread and outbreak of infectious disease, um, and the lack of ability to control that because the environment uh, you cannot change. So the lack of access to water, sanitation, good hygiene practices, shelter, warmth, um, food. So we're seeing that compounded effect on the population. So it it is a catastrophic situation that that that, that will not even even if 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 there were a fundamental change tomorrow, you know the population is not going to immediately recover from it. Can only get worse. We we've been calling for uh, um, an immediate and sustained ceasefire as the only way to create an environment in which you could actually start to try and address the catastrophic level of um, of harm that this population are, are, are facing currently. And alongside that then, you know, clear guarantees and means in which to bring in the level of assistance that's, that's proportional to the scale of need today. And we're far, far, far from that. Um, and then, and then as, we, as we see that on top of all of this, there is still an intent to conduct a high scale level of warfare yeah. in this country. So um, it, it remains almost Im- impossible um, to operate under these kinds of circumstances. So, so yeah, unless, unless we see fundamental change, which is, is the ceasefire, it's the opening of access, and it's, uh, it's guarantees to you know to stop indiscriminately targeting infrastructure civilians um etc then it's very very hard to imagine um the, the situation having any opportunity to improve in the in the short term you could just expanding on Cheryl's point you were in Nasser hospital that's in Khan Yunis um towards the the center was in north of or center of Gaza now a lot of the population has shifted and been displaced to the south because they feel that that was the safest place. So, you know, you have in excess of 1.5 million people, I suppose, now in Rafa, which is the border with Egypt. Tell us what you know and what you think your colleagues are going through at the Rafa Indonesia Field Hospital. I think that's where MSF is, is based. What's going on right there? Uh, what's going on there right now? It's it's not just the the war trauma and the wounds, but it's also the compounded effect of lack of sanitation, lack of uh, nutrition. It's this psychological trauma as well of expecting this huge ground offensive to take place. What would be going on in the hospital right now in Rafa? I mean, um, to be honest, I I you know I can't imagine I don't know i can talk to what i what i experienced myself and probably just kind of assuming that it's very yeah. similar um when we were in nasser hospital it was when that area han yunis was increasingly getting more dangerous and and actually the hospital that was packed of people who fled um was actually getting a little bit, there were rumors that maybe we should leave. So the the last two or three days, people started to leave. And also the staff who we've worked with um, started to evacuate more south and not show up. And there's this, there's this, um, uh, I guess, uh, atmosphere of Okay, like we we might we might be attacked tomorrow. Are we? Are you still going to stay or not? And I would say most of the staff stayed, but with concerns. And they also had family in the hospital who have evacuated with them, and and also they had their patients who they've been treating. And I know um, that. Uh, you know, I've been following, I've been trying to uh, see how they were doing on social media. And, and even when I watch Al Jazeera, I see, you know, my colleagues show up and, and talk. And I, even after um, I've left. And so many of them chose to stay um, despite the, 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 the attack. And Nasser Hospital was besieged. And actually, it was, I, I, I remember I was watching in January on the news that there were snipers 
Um, and uh, it was, it, you know, you had to risk your life to even move between the buildings, which I did all the time between the ER and the OR. And there was a wounded person outside and the staff who I actually worked with were ru running out under the snipers and just to, to retrieve an injured, to, to be able to treat them. And I think, you know, the, the concern of, of the people when I left were accurate, were correct. We're going to be next. We're going to be uh, attacked. And, you know, and then I see the people who have remained risking their lives and, and still helping people. Um, I think with my colleagues in Rafa, that might be similar, yeah. although I don't know the exact situation. And, I, and um, I also ask that because just geographically, when you look at Khan Yunus, which is slightly north of Rafa, and you mentioned just now, people were talking, should we move south? There was still that buffer, but this is it. Right. This is the last, yeah. this is the last point. Right. You can't go anywhere else. And the Rafa border is not, for all intents and purposes, is not open to, to free flow of people. So they're trapped right now. And that's that's really why I, I asked that question. But I, I want to just move a little bit into the, the conflict. And I'm very, very mindful of the fact that as MSF officials, you have to be non-political about this. But from the IDF side, the Israeli army side, they will, and they have always argued that hospitals were fair game because there are networks of tunnels under these hospitals which harbor Hamas fighters. Hospitals are dual use. They're not just used for medical purposes, but also for as military bunkers for, for Hamas. I'll ask you in a while because you were there in, in Nasser Hospital, whether you saw these so-called bunkers but maybe Paul first, what, what's your response to this? Well, we, we, we have never witnessed any medical facility being used in that way, the way that you have described that. We ne never saw really any evidence of that whatsoever. Um, and I, I, I don't think anybody has yet, has yet seen such evidence presented. Um, so certainly, you know, our own experience is, is quite different. This is speculative, Paul. You don't have to answer it. So why were hospitals and medical facilities attacked? W was it just sheer evil or sheer incompetence? What's going on there? I mean, we, we do not buy the argument, you know, that, that you know, that this, this is a casualty of conflict, no? That, mm. that this is war and, and this is what happens in war. We have systematically, I mean, we have witnessed a systematic destruction of health infrastructure. There have been over 400 medical facilities have been directly targeted. Of those, 20 medical facilities of MSF 20, uh, have, have been directly targeted. We have called for accountability. We have called for investigations. We have called for some kind of response to explain these actions. And we have received zero response on any of these accounts. So I, I, we, we do not buy this as an organization. This is either a strategy of, that's being conducted of warfare, which is, is one of total obliteration of infrastructure, um, or, or as you said, it is complete and abject incompetence, inability to actually conduct smart warfare, which would seem ludicrous under the circumstances. Dr. Yuko Nakajima, you were at Al Nasser Hospital. Did you see any of these things which some, or at least the official line from Israel, is justifying the attacks on hospitals, that there are tunnels, that there are Hamas people in the hospitals? I was there for three weeks, um, but I did not see anything that would even make me suspect um, that there's something going on. It was a hospital full of people needing help and everybody, the staff who were there were just busy treating patients. And that was it, we, that, that was all we did. Charel, I'm going to bring you in in a sec. Can you hear me? Yeah, let me just ask, let me just ask you go one quick follow-up before I, I go to you. Um, I know you're a doctor. You were there as a physician. Did you, seeing that there was no evidence for, for what they were doing, targeting 
medical infrastructure. Did that make you angry? Mm, of course. Um, of course, I was angry, but also um, just devastated, I guess. that I, I guess that's where it got to me, um, where uh, there's no rules. It seems like there's no humanity um, because directly you're seeing children and who are dying, losing arms. They did nothing to deserve this. Um, so like there's young women also. Um, so yeah, it made me angry and sad. Charo? Uh, yeah, um, I think KJ, we wanted to spend what's left of this uh, interview to, to venture a bit on the personal side of the two incredible people that are in the studio. Maybe I can begin to broach that, that side of things by asking how difficult is it to remain impartial uh, given everything that you've seen, given everything that you've, uh, you've witnessed occurring and maybe reflecting on you know, how much humanity and how much the international community has failed uh, in living up to its own international uh, humanitarian laws and standards and whether this, you hope, will be a turning point um, for, for, for better once this conflict um, stops. Mm. <clears throat> I think just doing what we are supposed to do which is providing medical care to the people in most need, that itself is impartial. MSF um, treats anybody on, you know, on both sides. If um, there's anybody wounded who needs medical care, I've, I've seen that happen in my other um, field assignments that ha I've been in, such as Syria, um, we, we've treated both sides. And that's, that's what we do. In Gaza, the context was there was only Palestinians who were wounded. And it, it was just doing the same thing, but in a different context. But we would do exactly the same if there were sure. IDF wounded people, we would treat them because they need medical care. And that is, that is the principles of, of MSF. Um, uh, you know, it, it does, it does make you, um, upset. And I do have my personal, uh, views and, and thoughts. However, uh, I think just telling, um, the facts on, on how it is, and what, what we've done, just facts, objectives, um, objective, you know, um, uh, telling just, just tells everything. I said, I think it says a sure. lot without having to be political. Yeah. When I go out and tell the story, I never go into political, yeah. my personal opinions or anything like that. Um, which especially being based in the United States, you know, it's a, it's a very sensitive, controversial you know, thing, but the strength of MSF is that we are in the field and we've seen the reality and we just tell the truth about what has happened. And I, I think that's, we're, we're one of the very few organizations that, that go out, you know, as much as we can. And I've been in many situations, many field assignments that, MSF is the only people in that area. Um, and, I, and, it, and it comes from um, being apolitical. The, the, how we do our medical activities, you know, the, the funding is not from governments, it's yeah. from individuals. That makes us very independent and impartial. So that's what I really love and am and proud of about MSF. So um, that's, I guess, how we can stay impartial um, yeah, it's from me. Paul, I'm going to uh, expand on that a little bit um, and and say that I agree 100% what Yuko said. The facts speak for themselves in Gaza. But is it difficult to just be dispassionate in MSF with just the facts alone and not want to <laughs> just say what you want to say? <laughs> Uh, we are incredibly passionate people in MSF and we ex express that. I, I think there's, there's a risk that, that we confuse the act of, of remaining neutral 
in other words, not not picking sides, um, was staying silent. We, it, for for us, we see this the, the reverse. We have an obligation because we are in this unique situation alongside an injustice that is being undertaken against our patients, against the population. We we have a responsibility and an accountability to our patients to bear witness publicly mm. to that reality. Mm. And that and we do that, as as Yuko said, in a fact-based way. We mm. speak to what we know and we provide um, evidence, either our own testimony or, or medical evidence that corroborates a reality that we have directly witnessed. And we see that mm. as an obligation as a humanitarian. We don't see that as a political act. You know, we can't change the course of this war, sure. but we can make sure um, that the cost of political action today has to be accounted for. We can make sure by making sure that the facts are there in the public domain and, and, and the impunity that we see today and the, 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 the level of, um, of complicit endorsement from states around the world for what, what's taking place you know, cannot go unchallenged. And we challenge it because we have this direct experience. So we're, I guess my message would be, you know, maintaining um, our, our neutrality, our independence. It doesn't mean we have to, we have to stay silent. So uh, that's extremely, extremely well put. Um, Cheryl, anything on your side to follow up on that? No, no, I absolutely love both those answers. I think that's, um, that's refreshing because we, you know, some people think impartiality means silence, and Paul, you you articulated so eloquently why it's not the case. I think you know this is not Paul and Yuko saying it. This is me saying it. I think what they've said is a is a worse indictment on what's what's happening than any political statement because it reflects facts on the ground, and it reflects uh, true reality from people who are clearly neutral politically. But um, I think their testimony is clear for anyone who who can process what's happening. Yuko, you were there for three weeks in, mm -hmm. in Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, would you go back? Yes, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. At great risk to your own personal safety. Have, uh, have you discussed this with your family? Your husband, maybe? My family has given up. <laughs> they, uh, they used to try to convince me out of these, uh, you know, going to the field. Um, but, uh, for example, this Gaza, um, when I received an email, I almost replied immediately that I am going. Um, but I hesitated a little bit. My husband is, he says, I'm a warrior. He worries a lot. He's like a mom and um, <laughs> always, always. I'm one hour late from work and he always texts like crazy. But anyway, he... So I can imagine <laughs> how he's worrying when he's you're in so, Gaza. <laughs> he's so worried. But um, he, you know, when I told him, I, you know, there is a call for an emergency team in Gaza. He took a big sigh and he's like, you're going, aren't you? And... That's kind of how my family is. They are worried, but they don't think they can change my mind. At that point in time, was there enough cell reception for you to text him every day? No. So the reception, the, the communication got less and less and less and less um, to during the stay. By the end of my three weeks, it was maybe if I'm lucky, I get to send out a text maybe once or twice a day. Okay. So yeah, sometimes it was like, I'll just send it. I don't know if it gets through, but I will send it. And so communication was very limited too. And if you don't mind me asking you, I mean, this is, this is perhaps a sensitive question, but how do you as a, as a physician on the front line deal with your own personal trauma after going to Gaza, because you've seen things. You've seen things that most people should never ever see in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. How do you process that? Or are you very good at just keeping that to one side for now? 
I have been good at doing that, but um, I guess I'm still trying to process. I haven't um, taken up the, the resources that MSF has. Um, MSF has robust uh, psychological care systems, you know, for, for people coming back from the field. Um, I just haven't, you know, I, I was just busy simply trying to catch up on things. Um, and I also, yes, just didn't take that opportunity. So, so still to this day, um, I, yeah, kind of, um, when I see patients, um, you know, in the U S and stuff like emergency, uh, in the ER, um, I just, uh, am so appalled at the, um, like the difference of medical care, feeling that we are so spoiled, including myself, um, you know, anybody who lives in a developed or a safe country are so spoiled. I feel bad when I uh, take a hot shower. Um, so it does still um, get to me. But um, I don't know, um, just, just, uh, and you know, testifying like this is one of the things that the people in Gaza asked me to do. Just please tell the people in your country what's going on and please uh, be a voice for us. So at least that keeps me going. Paul, you were also in the field. How do you deal with oh. this? How uh, do you tell your family about the risks of your of your job? Yeah, I mean, a, a bit like, Yuko-san, I've, I've been doing this a long, long time. <laughs> My family got very accustomed to not hearing from me for long periods of time. Um, I started in a, a, the, the time where communication anyway was incredibly limited. It was mostly by mail. Um, uh, and so, yeah, uh, over time, I, I, I never really appreciated, I think. I, I think we often, we're very selfish and we don't appreciate what we're putting family members through. Um, I met my wife in in, in Tajikistan, in Central Asia, you know, in, the, in a very insecure and stable period immediately post-conflict there. Um, and so we've both obviously followed this kind of line of work together and have a, a healthy appreciation for, for what we do. I think my family has a deep regard actually for this organization. I mean, we've been involved in a, a lot of incidents and, and difficult events that have impacted us um, and I, I think my family have learned to actually put quite a lot of trust and faith that it's an organization that is experienced, responsible, tries to do do things well, tries to really limit and mitigate that risk. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's quite it's quite a selfish road to take. Um, it's selfless and selfish at the same time, perhaps. Yeah, the, in there's, a way. there's in fact a, a documentary that's been made about about it, members of MSF and what's motivated them. And, and the title they landed on was was not selfless, but selfish. <laughs> <laughs> because it was the term that came up so often in these kinds of interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can understand that. But I think from the perspective of somebody who's admiring the work that you do, it's selfless. But I can understand why for the families, perhaps, it's it's uh, that word is being used. Cheryl, do you have any concluding thoughts before we wrap things up? Yeah, just a brief one for me. Uh, well, one is to say that I completely agree with KJ. It's, it's for us, it's more selfless, not selfish. But my maybe concluding question is, um, you know, what can our audience do for people like MSF? Um, is, there, is there a way we can contribute? Uh, what kind of support that maybe you, you guys need uh, that maybe our audience ought to know? I mean, I mean, for... for, for this question comes up all the time and there are many different things that can be done. I mean, what we're doing now is probably the most important thing today is to, is to not accept that what is happening now um, is in any way conceivably acceptable. Yeah. And we need to reject that. We need to denounce that. We need to strive for accountability and truth. We need, we need to confront um, yeah, we need to confront this and we, we all need to find a channel you know, to channel that, to channel that outrage. And, and I think what, what we're doing here is helping people be well informed and to have an opinion and to express that opinion through whatever platforms they have and communication mediums they have. Um, and that, that's fundamentally important. Um, as an organization, yeah, I mean, 
you can support us directly. Um, we are there. There are other organizations, good organizations that are there. Um, and, and, and you can look at ways that you can, you can work through them. No, you, you, you can, you can help them with the work that they're doing. Um, and you can literally work for, for us. I mean, we, we need, um, professionals, medical professionals, particularly, but a whole range of, of skill sets. Um, we depend on having a, a strong intake of people into the organization. And we have, we have many Malaysians who work with us around the world. Um, but yeah, I really think this this individual responsibility of of not allowing the kind of stagnation of this of this situation six months now yeah. um, we, we, we it's only getting worse. Um, th- th- it continues with abject impunity. There is no accountability for what's taking place, um, and we have to make sure that our countries at least we do everything we can to make sure they reject and work against this reality today. I think we we have spoken at great length and we'll put in the show notes some of the links to MSF where you guys, listeners and, and viewers of KS can uh, perhaps look and, and see if you can support in your own way. We've spoken at length about the indefatigable spirit of the MSF workers and volunteers in Gaza as well as in other conflict zones. I just wanted to end perhaps with Yuko. What, from what you saw, what is the spirit of the Palestinians in Gaza? Are they hopeful, defiant? That's their homeland. They are a people who have been displaced and dispossessed for many, many years. What sense did you get? Resilience. Resilience. I was surprised with um, Palestinians who had just lost their homes, their families, continue to work, you know, and sometimes joke, you know, they're a little bit, you know, with a, with a, um, like a, you know, like a normal mood when something devastating happened to them. And it was many staff I worked with, many family members still feeling friend, uh, still, you know, being friendly. Uh, A lot of uh, people approached me and were curious, you know, where did you come from? You know, thank you for coming. You know, um, when I said I'm from Japan, um, they, you know, they said, oh, you know, you're like us, you know, And, and I was like, you know, a little intrigued. And, and the thing is, you know, uh, they, they told me, and it probably happened a a couple times that, uh, we know that Japan was destroyed in world war II, and you guys helped each other, the community helped each other. And, and now you have rebuilt to such a wonderful and safe country. And, and, you know, they, they really related to, to Japan and that was um, that was very uh, refreshing for me to hear that there's hope. Everybody was helping each other, and there's this notion of you know we we are going to help each other and rebuild, and you know and be a safe and happy you know country is is the yeah the notion I got. Thank you so much, Yuko. Thank you, Paul, for spending time with us. Um, Sharil, anything? No, um, all the best and thank you for the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. And we extend our support from Malaysia, from listeners of KS and our prayers uh, for the good work that MSF is doing for our Palestinian brothers and sisters in Gaza that um, there's an end to this um, as, as soon as, as possible. Uh, Dr. Yuko Nakajima and Paul McFun from Medicine Sans Frontier. Thank you so much for being on KS. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.